it's a, a pleasure and, and an honor really to, to do this. Uh, it'll be a, a really short presentation here, um, by no means uh, covering um, anywhere near the uh, scope of uh, Merriam's work, but just a couple of you know, major highlights uh, that I can uh, talk about in in uh, you know five or seven minutes. Um, I should say if you're, I would recommend if you want to have a longer, read a longer um, presentation, uh, you can look at, I didn't write down the, oops, the, the webpage, um, but uh, Kurt, Kurt, McS Kurt McMullen's webpage at Harvard uh, gives a, a longer uh, description of, of, uh, uh, of her work uh, that, that he presented at, in, in, in Seoul. Uh, for the Fields Medal. Okay, um, so the first part is about hyperbolic geometry, and um, it's very similar to what Miriam was uh, talking about just a few minutes ago. Um, so this is somewhat repetitive, or if not completely repetitive. Um, so the first part is hyperbolic geometry, counting simple closed curves. Um, so I'm repeating, I guess, you know what Miriam does. But we have a, a topological surface, uh, let's say a closed surface, genus at least two. Um, you can put um, many Riemann surface structures on X on that surface. The collection of all of, all of them is the moduli space MG. Um, now each Riemann surface comes equipped with a unique hyperbolic metric, a metric of constant curvature minus one. And um, again, this is repetitive. Uh, I'm you know, repeating what Mary and I talked about in, uh, in the talk. A basic problem is to count the number of closed geodesics of length less than or equal to L. And um, this is, I'm putting the result that was on the board earlier. This grows exponentially and um, e to the L. And uh, as, as, as Mary pointed out, it doesn't depend on the genus. It doesn't depend on the particular surface x. Um, OK, a uh, more difficult problem is to count the number of simple closed curves. Now, again, uh, what she was talking about more generally is counting number of curves with k silk intersections. I'm going to talk about some previous work of hers where uh, uh, counting the number of simple closed geodesics. Um, there are many fewer, as, as we've seen, and it's um, hard to decide if an element of, a, of the fundamental group or the free homotopic class gives rise to a simple geodesic. I mean, if you try to write it as a, a, a basis or in the basis or something, it doesn't, it's hard to decide. And there's um, the theorem. Um, for, uh, the number of simple closed geodesics of length at most L on, on the surface X is asymptotic to a constant uh, depending on x, so that's c sub x, and then there's this polynomial growth, uh, l to the 6d minus 6. Um, so I want to contrast it with counting all closed curves, which was exponential. Uh, here uh, is polynomial, there are many fewer of them, and the constant um, depends on the surface, unlike before. Um, and, okay, so that's the, um, one of the theorems, uh, breakthrough theorems of, of, uh, of hers about, um, about this subject. And, and what is remarkable is that there's an asymptotic formula at all, um, and the constant depends on the surface. And as she was describing um, in the last talk, um, the proof involves studying the geometry of the moduli space. And um, so somehow, to get information about a particular surface, you look at this, the set of all surfaces of this kind of fixed topological type. And uh, again, as she remarked in uh, saying the same sentence, is that this is a fairly common theme in the subject. Um, if you're analyzing an individual surface, um, one often studies the space of all surfaces. Um, the last... Uh, sentence here is um, a wonderful byproduct of the analysis is something, I don't know, is very appealing to me, a lot of people. If, for example, in genus two, um, you could look at uh, the separating curves, that's one 
topological telephony <coughs> drew the separating curve on the left surface, or you could count non-separating curves. And um, as she pointed out, there's really only one non-separating curve in the sense that all of them are topologically the same that you can get from one to another by an element in the mapping class group. And in the, if you look at all closed curves of length less than or equal to L, the probability that you take a, get a non-separating curve is six sevenths. Um, and the probability you get a separating curve is one out of seven. So you choose a random curve in G is two, and the probability that it's going to divide the surface into two components is only one out of seven. So it's just a, a I mean, a, a very nice uh, um, Pro, uh, byproduct of what, what her analysis. Okay, that's my uh, what three minute uh, description of in hyperbolic geometry. And now let me go to the next um, theme in or another theme in her work, which is to study uh, flat geometry, um, which goes by also sometimes by the name of translation surfaces. So before we had hyperbolic geometry. Um, um, curvature of minus one. And now um, a fairly big subject these days is to study translation surfaces. So what's a translation surface? Um, I've drawn a, or I should say Anton Zorich drew a, gave me a, a, a polygon on the right. Um, so you look at this polygon on the right and you take um, opposite sides um, are identified uh, if they're parallel, as they are, of the same length. So the blue sides are identified, they're parallel of the same length, the red sides and so forth. This is an example of a translation surface. It has curvature, it's zero curvature, it just looks like Euclidean geometry, um, except at the um, vertices of the polygon, which in this case are all identified with each other. And that vertex gives a point on the surface with, with concentrated negative curvature. So they're flat, called flat surfaces with singular points or points with concentrated negative curvature. Um, it can also be described, a translation surface, as a holomorphic one form on a Riemann surface. Omega, the holomorphic one form is dz. And um, that's invariant under translation, so you get a holomorphic one form and then the vertex becomes a zero of the holomorphic one form. And the collection of all translation surfaces with specified zeros is forms a moduli space of holomorphic one forms. Um, and, okay, so these translation surfaces come up in many different contexts. One of them is studied billiards and polygons. Since they come from Riemann surfaces and holomorphic one forms, that's a very classical subject. So it's a, it's a fairly, it's a very vibrant subject these days. And much of the vibrancy or the interest of the subject comes from studying the action of the group SL2R on this moduli space. And so the reason it's a moduli space, I should say, is that you could vary the side lengths of that polygon, so you could get families of identified of polygons. And the group SL2R acts because, in a very natural way, because the two by two matrix acts on the polygon just as a linear transformation in the plane. In the study of the SL2R action, uh, again, the theme is somehow that you care about the individual translation surface and the way you often study the translation surface is to study its action, the action of the SL2R orbit. So you're interested in that particular translation surface. You study its orbit under SL2R, and that gives you often some information if you understand the orbit. So one subgroup of SL2R is the diagonal group. The action has a name. It's called the type Muller geodesic flow. Um, but the orbit of a point can be exotic. It can be a Cantor set. And this is actually reminiscent of a geodesic flow on a surface of constant negative curvature. The flow of the geodesics um, can have very complicated orbit closure. 
And so this brings me to the um, more most recent theorem of, of Miriam with uh, co-authors Alex Eskin and Amir Mohammadi. Um, and what they have shown is, without being completely specific here, they've <coughs> identified all orbit closures. All there are no weird orbit closures in this moduli space. Every orbit closure is a affine submanifold of so there's no weird things going on. Now I, I would say first of all this is um, fantastic. I mean it's already had a number of wonderful applications which I, I don't have time to 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 talk about. But I think most people sort of work in this area, didn't think such a theorem is possible. And the reason that it's so striking is, in some sense, the motivation comes from the work of Margulis Ratner and others on, you have a Lie group G, let's say, well, some, some Lie group SLN, LNR, and you have a lattice gamma in the Lie group, and the work of, uh, of, of, of Ratner said, identified what orbit closures for a unipotent subgroup. And, but the reason, in some sense, that Ratner and Margulis, that, that works in this context of, of Lie groups is that you're dealing with a Lie group with that algebraic structure, it's a homogeneous space, and, and, so, and so forth. In the case of moduli space, it's not a Lie group, there's no, in fact, in fact it's almost the opposite of being homogeneous. So the, um, this makes, that's why the, their ability to find all orbit closures is, is a really striking, um, striking result. Um, I'm, I'm done. Thank you.